With that, let me call a couple of my colleagues up over here. Um, and I, I believe that that is Jonathan Campion and Professor Gilbert, Dr. Campion and uh, Peter Gilbert, uh, if you're around. We're going to have a little bit of a discussion about uh, the social and uh, public health aspects of meditation, which of course are tremendous. Survey. I wonder if you might just summarize some of the high points of that, that lovely talk that you gave earlier today. Uh, thanks, yes. I mean, it's, um, I think, uh, yeah, the continuum of, of, uh, of well being and um, illness, I think, is uh, certainly something that policy uh, development in the UK has been very interested in. Um, and I think also the fact that um, it's not actually that well-being isn't at the other end of illness. Actually, they, they can interestingly co they're, they're sort of interrelated dimensions. So that you can, uh, for instance, recovery of illness, you can um, have still some symptoms of illness, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that you've got no wellness. So that there's an inter, inter interesting relationship between the two. Um, I think certainly the, the uh, if we're looking at, for instance, the medical model. Um, as uh, doctors or health professionals, we tend to get trained in illness. Um, I went through general practice training and then psychiatry training, and I got no training in wellness, um, which is kind of which is an interesting. We're at an interesting point now, and there's a lot of interest in well-being promotion, health um, health promotion, that state of of wellness, rather than just the absence of illness. And um, I think that it added value. Wellness, for instance, if we take it to the um, the workplace, um, when, when we're when we're firing all cylinders, when we're when we're when we're feeling very good, um, our creativity, our productivity um, is, is is much greater. There's a lot of interest, I think, even going into the in, into how productive um, uh, companies and you know sort of, uh, our, our work is in those areas. Um, I think in terms of just coming back to the, the, the talk, I, I, was, I was really trying to highlight, I guess, the, the benefits of well-being, the tremendous costs of mental <coughs> ill health, and, um, and then uh, really looking at quite a lot of interest, again, by governments around how do we promote that wellness across the population, uh, how, can we, how can we prevent certain lots, a lot of good proportion of mental ill health, and then outlining um, some of the intervention, and of course, including meditation, mindfulness, and, and a broad range of different uh, practices that I think you were very, uh, you, you were very kind of um, spot on in highlighting that there is kind of, there's an overlap between uh, different elements of these different meditation practices. And, uh, and certainly I think there's a particularly um, one of the one of the things that shocked me when I was when I was doing policy development was that half of lifetime mental illness starts by the age of 14. So a great opportunity if we're thinking about resilience, the promotion of resilience early on, which can then last a lifetime. Um, schools, young people, 
and meditation and, and this kind of reflective um, the opportunities for, for for learning these skills early on is um, is particularly uh, yes, particularly exciting. Well, you know, I, I think it's really a, such an important point that the early introduction of these very valuable skills you, you get. I mean, I think we older folks deserve it as well, of course. <laughs> but you do get so much more mileage, as we say, uh, in the states from the early introduction, and that maybe is just a good uh, kickoff point for your um, your Australian work, which I thought was really very fascinating. Perhaps you could share it with some of the people who weren't at your talk today. Yeah, I mean, this was um, Ernie Christie and Kathy Day from Townsville came over for the education seminar in, uh, last December. And uh, certainly, they're, they, um, they're, they're uh, working at the uh, Diocese of Townsville, Catholic Diocese of Townsville, and there they um, they really decided that um, she meditation was part of the uh, the the school life, um, and so in 2005 decided to actually introduce meditation um, into well now it's 33 schools, 12,000 children between the ages of five and 18, and they do meditation a lot of portion. On a daily basis, and the children do it on the uh, the number of life years, and the, so the number of minutes of meditation depend on them on how old the children are. So, a six-year-old will do it six minutes a day, ten-year-old will do it ten minutes a day. And what was really extraordinary about that was um, was was going uh, going to three of these schools and interviewing um, cross section of children, um, teachers, and uh, parents. And seeing really the very significant impacts, and I was I was speaking that I was speaking to a, to to someone in, in the break and saying that actually listening to the experience of children uh, describing meditation very freely um, was actually one of the most profound kind of uh, teachings I think I've experienced in terms of uh, it was really very much coming from the heart and. Um, yeah, very, very powerful. So, can you give us some sort of telling quotes or fascinating little nuggets? <laughs> uh, no pressure. Or anything. Um, I, I think uh, I think what particularly struck me was um, you know some children who particularly been through difficulty, and then this description of how it had really turned things around for them. So they were kind of on this kind of edge. Maybe you could have seen them turning to drugs or, or other healthless behaviour and then finding something which was really precious um, and it wasn't really particularly associated with church and there was a really nice video that early showed of, of kind of you know, very regular kids talking about the, the impact it had had but I think the other, the other issue which really struck me was that it was transferable to actually when they were experiencing distress outside school they used it then so it was kind of Something they learn that they could actually carry with them. Yeah, I must say, I, I will be talking tomorrow about transcendental meditation, including in schools. They've done some studies um, with that in the American school system. But the one thing that I have seen across the board is people saying it just gives us those few more seconds in which to respond. So, in other words, a lot of times people will make mistakes by rapid, impulsive actions that are not responses, that are reflexive reactions. And just having the opportunity to think. One kid um, uh, said, you know, when I walk down the hall and another kid would bump me, I would hit him. Now when he bumps me, I say to myself, should I hit him or not? <laughs> That's kind of encapsulates for me what the meditation does. It gives them, and prisoners, the same deal. A lot of them are there because they've got anger management problems, because they've lost their temper, and that keeps them in jail or lands them back in jail when they're out. And just those few more seconds to say, is it worth my while when I think it's gone? Or is it going to cost me too much? So, anyway, that's one thing I've heard. 
Um, let me extend our discussion following your conversation of earlier, which was sort of so rich with many different things. Was there anything in that talk that, in, in retrospect, you might have wanted to add or that today's discussions have triggered in your mind to reflect on? I, I think what we did in the, in, in the workshop was um, take some of those issues and, and explore them. <coughs> and um, I, I started with a bit of music from India about one moment from heaven and going, going home. So I asked people if they had a sort of a moment from, from heaven, a life-changing moment, and also where they saw home. And we had some really uh, fascinating discussions. So I want, um, the, the first um, story that um, was told, that, was, that, it, it, that is sticking in my mind at the moment, was somebody who was um, uh, working on their banister at home and suddenly had a life-changing feel that actually they should um, take up a caring profession. Um, and that that sort of route, that change, that journey actually worked for them and that's how they have moved. And what we were saying in the group was, well, to a certain extent, you've got to be listening to the call, you've got to hear the call, and then you've got to respond. Because sometimes I talk to people who say, I think I had a call once, but I, I didn't respond to it, it wasn't the right time, or I let it know because had you could have done, I always wish I'd taken a different, a different route. So again, I suppose it's, again, it's that course, isn't it, of just thinking, yes, perhaps I can respond. Um, to what extent, and this is something I've wondered about, um, and I'll ask both of you about this, talking about the call. You know, sometimes the call can come in the form of a directive or a cognitive message, but I think in many instances it comes in the form of a state change that's affective. I know that when um, Sheikh Elminski was, was talking earlier, I felt an effective change, um, the cultivation of presence, you, you might call it, or something. And I've seen, in terms of my experience with other people, that a state of transcendence or a state of shifting that sort of sense of consciousness can actually be a precursor to some kind of transformation. When you talk about a calling, are you talking about something of a cognitive nature or are you talking about an actual consciousness shift of that kind? I'm, I'm not sure really. I think I've opened to various, various interpretations. Um, I, I, I suppose it's um, one of the things that's really around the um, um, retreats that we've done at the work, and I was saying this to uh, a couple of them over lunch. But actually, sometimes it's those who are often atheistic or agnostic persuasion who enjoyed and appreciated that experience more than people who are coming necessarily from a Christian tradition because it's been such a sort of radical change for them. It's given them a glimpse into, into something else and a sort of rhythm of life that perhaps they haven't, haven't seen before. Um, but again, of course, they've got to be receptive. Sorry, mm -hmm. Dr. Kemp, you had experience with that? I mean, I suppose coming from a, from a I guess, a public health perspective, we're, we're, we're kind of exposed to various kind of levels of call uh, around us which we can ignore or, and maybe are influencing, influencing us at different levels. And I think over time, or over concentration, then you can see that if we're looking at a, a thousand people, a hundred thousand people, the greater that is kind of, I guess, the supportive environment for facilitating those opportunities or those kinds of, um, that kind of thing, then if we're looking at, uh, yes, a public health kind of uh, uh, facilitation, then, then certainly there are things that can, that can maybe increase the the opportunities for those kinds of processes or, or actually reduce them likewise. I think if we're looking again across the inequality spectrum, it, inequality does drive so much of ill health and good health. 
and likewise spiritual health. So, so I think uh, maybe that's just something to you not directly answer the question. You know, um, I certainly know that a lot of people meditate regularly and they never have transcendent experiences or um, shifts in consciousness and the meditation works brilliantly and can be life-changing. On the other hand, um, I have seen people who do have these transcendent experiences and I've often wondered, you know, what is the role of those transcendent experiences in transformation? Does it have a role? Is it incidental? Is it just a joyful experience? But in one case, I actually was persuaded that it had an actual instrumental impact on the change. This was a woman in her mid-60s in Washington, D.C. She was a long-standing government employee, now retired. She had a high position as a manager. And even though she'd been a brilliant student, she never really felt totally okay about herself. And she had to keep racking up accomplishments as a way of validating that she was worth something. She said, it's as though I had to constantly build up my resume to feel like I was okay, and constantly get validation from others. And then she just started her Transcendental Meditation training, and one or two days into it, she had this experience of change in consciousness, like this transcendent state. And we can talk more about that tomorrow. But the point here was she was driving to get to her next lesson. And she was driving in the lower part of Washington, D.C., which is very beautiful because it's got all these monuments. And she was listening to her favorite group whom I had never heard of before. It's called Schooner Main. And they, they were talking about boats of stone, that was the name of the song, about how the boats had come down towards Washington, these big stones that had been hewn from up in Maine, and they were going to be stones that were going to be turned into monuments. And for the first time she said, you know, you've done really well with your career. Thumbs up to you. You know, you, what you've done, is like a monument. You built this body of work and it was really terrific. And she said she had never previously had that kind of thought. And that realization, if you want to call it that, was enduring. It was not a transient thing. It was a change in the way she saw herself immediately following this shift. So I think it's, I mean, I mean, I think there's just more in this whole process than we really necessarily understand. But I, I'm sort of so happy to be sharing these mysteries and their goodness with them. I wonder if this point would be good just to open for um, my colleagues, uh, the stage for some questions. Would that be a good thing? We're, we're out of time. As George Bernard Shaw once said, you know the subject may not be exhausted, but the audience is. <laughs>